Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of In The Lead. In The Lead, as you know, uh, presents extraordinary leaders who talk about their leadership, their perspectives on leadership so that they can inspire our leadership. Today's episode presents Daisy Chitilapilli of Cisco. But before we get there, do remember to like, share and subscribe should you like the content of this episode. And do not forget to hit the bell icon so that you can receive notifications of future episodes. With that, let's move forward with In The Lead. In this episode of In The Lead, we're delighted to present Daisy Chittilapilli. Daisy Chittilapilli is president for India and the South region for the much admired technology giant Cisco. In her role as president, Daisy is responsible for strategy, sales, operations, and investments to drive long-term growth for Cisco in India and the SARC region. Daisy has a career spanning over 25 years in the tech industry, including 17 years of leadership experience at Cisco. She has a strong reputation for transforming operations and cultures to drive growth and scale, and is known for her rich experience and knowledge in digitally enabling organizations and developing go-to-market strategies around software and services. Daisy is passionate about encouraging the youth to make careers in the technology space. She also mentors startups to innovate technology solutions for the most urgent and pressing social challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, in this episode of In The Lead, presenting Daisy Chittilapilli. Thank you, Sujaya. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure being here. Thank you. Um, Daisy, I'm going to start right at the start. I know it's been just about a month since you've uh, taken over as president. This is a big role. And um, you know, I'm keen to try and understand, especially in the interest of those who have also taken on big roles, big leadership roles during these times. What does it mean to be able to walk into a large leadership role um, in the midst of uh, upheavals in challenging times? which are also times of opportunities. So, Sujay, you're right, actually, you know, um, leading through change and leading through obstacles is not really new for a leader in any in any organization, in any, any business. But I think the last 18 months have been uh, unprecedented because it's almost a black swan event, right? Yeah, definitely. And we've all had to reinvent all of the things that we took for granted, whether it's the way we worked, whether the children went to school, how do we work from home, uh, possibly without the best infrastructure in place, like countries like India, we were not set up for it perfectly when we went into COVID, you know, so we'd had to do deal with a degree of change that is unprecedented, at least uh, in my entire career of 25 plus years, we've not seen a similar situation. So the ask of leaders has been, uh, it's been a balancing act, right? So on the one hand, um, you know, you have to be there for your people. You have to put people first. You have to put the communities you are at the, you know, you are a part of at the center and in front of everything that you do. So, um, and that means leading with empathy, leading with compassion. And there's enough that has been said about leadership styles that lead with empathy and leaders who lead with empathy and compassion coming out of it, walking out of it much better than leaders who don't. So I think. I would say that's a position of strength as a leader if you lead with empathy and compassion. Um, so that's that's the one side. But on the other side, every disruption is also an opportunity. And as a business leader, it's your job, it's your responsibility to make sure that you shape that opportunity in a way that your business and your ecosystem can capitalize on that opportunity. And often that opportunity is a little bit vague to start with. So it is in the hands of the leader to make sure that the organization can find that, you know, spotting the opportunity and then translating what that opportunity means to your teams and to not just your employees, but your partners, et cetera. And over the last 18 months, the power of partnerships, because everybody, whether it's, you know, if I talk about us at Cisco, Cisco, our partner ecosystem, as well as our customers have all hit, have got all got hit by change and we've all figured out that coming together as a single ecosystem and problem solving is better than trying to tackle this uh, on our own. So, you know, um, but at the same time, when we go after emerging opportunities, which get, which take shape during a disruption, acting with speed is important because otherwise, you know, in the business world, 
you have a limited opportunity to establish differentiation in a runway to break away from the rest of the crowd. So it's almost, I would say, a split brain syndrome way of operating where, you know, you have to on one side be available for your people and for your communities as we all go through this emotional roller coaster, right? But on the other side, also focus your people on emerging opportunities, which the disruption is leading to, and cap, you know, move with speed to capitalize on those opportunities. And the and the last piece is the leader is not divorced from this reality of the emotional roller coaster, right? And so why they find themselves in this position where as a leader, I don't have the answers to many of the questions. I'm facing all of these uncertainty and volatility myself, but I have I'm also in a position of having to provide leadership and manage through the change and turmoil for other people who are looking up to me to do that. So it's been an interesting time, uh, Sujaya, but I think all in all, I, th I feel, you know, uh, sitting in the position that we are in and not to diminish the degree of loss that many of us have gone through and our teams have gone through, uh, but walking out of it much stronger, both on the personal side as well as on the on the business side, right? So it's a good place to go. Right. I actually coined a terminology around this called soldiering on. And I think leaders have actually learned how to soldier on. And I think it's part of the adaptability um, that you're um, that you're actually articulating right now. I want to be able to look at Industry 4.0 or even the knowledge era, which took its own time to be able to really unfold. And my question to you is, what does an Industry 4.0 leader look like? What does it mean to be a leader, uh, an Industry 4.0 leader? So what is this contemporary leader like to you? Uh, what COVID has probably brought home is what can be delivered electronically must be delivered electronically. Now, the, uh, the, it's, it's very easier said than done in the industry for auto, uh, you know, manufacturing and some of the traditional industries that we associate with the industry for auto space to do all of that online. But I think a digital first thinking in leadership and right from the top and percolating all the way down is, is important because I think Companies that had digital initiatives who were re slightly ready or were already on that path prior to COVID, they found that they could pivot much more faster than companies which were doing the wait and watch uh, conversation. The worldwide disruption to manufacturing plant operations, supply chain operations, uh, logistics operations, that has taught us, and COVID is not going to be the last disruptor the world is going to see. I mean, it may be a pandemic, it may be something else altogether, some geopolitical upheaval altogether, or a natural calamity, which is increasingly becoming the norm of the day with the degree of climate change that we are seeing. So there is a call, there is an awakening and an understanding that we need to have technology embedded into all, I mean, for even, of course, you know, manufacturing plants, oil and gas uh, companies, etc. They have a significant amount of technology in their in in their core uh, business. Of course, they do. But the conversation about embedding digital technologies uh, into their processes, into their workflows, making their people more um, digitally savvy, all of that is, I think, the need of the hour. So, leadership that thinks digital first, even in a in what is a traditionally uh, a traditional industry. Uh, I think that is, you know, and it's not digital and technology is not something for the CIO to go and think about. And I think there is increasing understanding of that. If I'm the board, if I am the CEO of a company, I need to understand technology and I need to understand digital technologies because that can, you know, separate my survival as a company. It's come down to that. It's really come down to that. So you need to have a working knowledge, understanding, of uh, cloud, of cybersecurity, of IoT, of artificial intelligence, machine language. And you must understand how those technologies can help you uh, shape your business for the future. And you must also understand, I think, as leaders in any business, that a, a player coming with skills in a parallel or an adjacent industry can, can, can come and eat your lunch, breakfast, yeah. and dinner. Right? So that you have to have a working understanding of how deep tech startups as an example, what these technologies are doing is they're lowering the entry barriers that have traditionally protected, you know, worked as protective moats around traditional industries. And you have, you know, you have the ability for disruption coming at you from places which you had never had to anticipate your next generation of competitor coming from. 
this is the twofold strategy, right? You have to understand how it can help you differentiate, build your next generation of services and products and revenue streams and differentiation and customer experience and all of that on the one side. But on the other side, you have to understand how a player coming with these skills can actually come in and, uh, and disrupt you. So you need a working understanding of both. And therefore, then to translate that into your business plan, your operational plan, your people plan, uh, that you know all of that has to happen. You have to rethink what your ecosystem could look like for the future, what your partnerships can look like for the future. Because one of the things about uh, digital is you, no one company can do it. It is forcing people who would have been traditionally competitors to get together and work together. So there's this whole thought process about partnerships. I touched on digital literacy because skills are very, very rare in this in this space, and it will, um, you know. So there's this whole element of figuring out where your talent pool will come from. So people who understand your domain but who also are digitally skilled, that's an extremely rare uh, you know, combination. So your talent strategy will change. Yeah, so, and you know, you've uh, kind of just given me the backdrop to come in with my conversation around digital literacy because you've actually spoken about that and the need to want to learn this from the CIO. I think this is a very important part of this conversation really because I wanted to talk about um, you know, the whole future of work and this whole business of every business becoming a technology company, every company becoming a technology company and the need for digital literacy within organizations. What is your own experience and what is your own view on the need to be a digital savvy leader and what does a digital savvy leader really look like? Well, one trait I would say is curiosity, right? Just to just to keep looking, uh, not just in your ecosystem and in your pond, but the ability to go out and engage in forums that you wouldn't typically. And this, we see people doing this really well, right? So, um, uh, you, you you know, one of the conversations that I've been, uh, you know, we stay very close to, we have a partnership with NASCAM on skilling as Cisco. Mm -hmm. And one of the conversations that uh, we, uh, one of the requests that we got is on cybersecurity, right? So NASCAM typically is known as the as the industry body for IT and tech in the in the country. But if you look at NASCOM, the kind of companies that come to NASCOM for advice and therefore to NASCOM's members for advice come from traditional industries like banking and from manufacturing and oil and gas and so on and so forth. And one of the topics for conversation today is cybersecurity. I mean, to the point that, you know, there's a great degree of awareness about cybersecurity. Uh, so everybody knows it's no longer an if, it is only a question of when. And if you look at the search data for India, it, you know, the, it's the 600% increase in attacks during the COVID period is, is mind boggling and nobody is spared. You're a 500 crore company or a 5,000 crore company or you're a government or a state government institution. Everybody is at, uh, everybody is at risk. But the, uh, but the conversation is what, what do you do about it, right? So there are enough number of, I mean, and we had, uh, we have some conversations where they know cyber, they've heard about it, but they really don't know it in the context of their business and what they need to do. So there's all yeah. the way from the awareness level at the board level, the CEO, CXO level. And I would say perhaps the generation two, generation three skilling, because this threat landscape is constantly evolving. The players are constantly yeah. evolving and they are evolving at a higher, unfortunately, at a higher degree of speed than the businesses are evolving in this space. Yeah. So, you know, the, the skilling, a requirement for people and at the grassroots have to deal with it. So you have to do work on multiple levels, right? What do you do as a board to de-risk your business? What do you do as an CEO and the leadership team? And how do you prepare for an event like this? Because it's only about preparing for an event. It's no longer a question of uh, whether it will happen to you. And then you need the guardrails in terms of do you will your internal people be skilled to deal with it? Do you have partners who are better and adept at doing it who will uh, work with you in close conjunction and be wasted to your cost to keep you safe. So this is the conversation. If you talk about artificial intelligence or you talk about blockchain or you talk about IoT, it's the same conversation, right? And every, every layer has to interpret this technology and translate it in a way that uh, matters. In. And I think um, curiosity, I mentioned curiosity, but this is also this, you know, we are also moving away from a time when education was a once in a early stage experience yeah. to education, which is a lifelong experience and at all levels of an organization, right? So leaders have to, leaders have to, so curiosity is one part, but leaders have to have clear conversations around 
how will you make yourself and your organization that you lead unlearn and relearn and for every industry to industry it may be the time period may be different but you almost have to yeah. reboot yourself from or re disrupt yourself from the inside in terms of your skill profile you know what you've learned already doesn't ever go away but sometimes you have to unlearn in in yeah. this world you know the uh, you know we've always built learning as a as a pyramid structure right so you're building yeah. on top of what you already know and for some of the ways in which particularly to figure out how digital can disrupt your world you have to unlearn what you know and be willing to embrace be curious and be willing to embrace something that would have someone would have dismissed as fantastical thinking just maybe 12 yeah. to 18 to 24 months ago right like yeah. so the learning is not a problem for us but the unlearning is very difficult because we are all yeah. products of you know experience is considered such a big thing right in the world we live yeah. in your collective yeah. experience is the foundation on which you build newer and newer fountains fonts of knowledge and uh, sometimes you just have to break the rules and break glass so to be willing to do that to be willing to put yourself and as leaders it's not a great place because leaders uh, it's it's quite amazing that as the more successful you are the more afraid of failure you are Yeah. So you know the, the the ability for you, especially if you're in a very successful business, or so you a you're successful, b you're in a very successful business. So your risk appetite sometimes yeah. is not at the levels at which it needs to be. So curiosity yeah. is unlearning and re constant unlearning and relearning, and then the ability to take risk or high change agility. Right? Yeah. Those are those are things that are um, that probably I would say are the traits of a digital leader. Yes, and you have to do all of this without dropping a note on the quarterly results and everything else, yeah. which which yeah. is very interesting. So yeah. uh, we talk yeah. about hybrid in the context of work, and yeah. we talk about dual uh, dual mode IT and all of these things. Yes. I think even in leadership, you have to yeah. work in almost a dual mode, right? Uh, what you know and what you can count on, but and then the the part of your leadership style, which is all about so it's one part of you is steady. and stable and the other part of you is volatile and disruptive and constantly breaking glass uh, yeah. and to then marry, yeah. marry both of these uh, is, yeah. is is the call for the future i would yeah. say today it's no digital something else yeah. but yeah 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 you obviously i treating the and also Uh, and that, that you yeah. need to navigate during these times you know which which moves me to the next part of the question you spoke about these being unprecedented times you spoke about uh, these being times of upheavals uh, black swan 18 months and the rest tell me what has been uh, with the very extensive leadership experience you have even before you took over as president what has been the most difficult decision you've ever had to make as a leader for a leader you know sometimes your mistakes are very difficult to admit you are the idea originator and when you have to kill the idea yourself i think that's uh, that is sometimes a position of great um, internal strife for a leader when you are in a startup mode inside a large company you know most of the people around you they already feel that they have to be lauded just for taking that risk of going out and trying to do something new and in that space when you birth an idea and uh, you have to kill it yourself it is yeah. uh, it's one of the most uh, difficult discussions uh, decisions for a leader because you have spent yeah. all your time communicating creating followership for an idea getting people on board and then you have to go back and tell that same team that i'm sorry this idea is not working so we are we are going to kill this idea right so because ultimately with any any change that you're communicating you have to the impact on people more than the idea itself its impact and on the morale and motivation of people to do the next big idea is also something yeah. that you have to think about right so you want people to embrace change you want them to take risk you want them uh, to you know jump head first into uh, into spaces that will set up the company for success or the team for success and when you do this conversation about a highly invested in highly motivated team everybody is on board and you say kill it right <laughs> pretty much yeah. it's not just yeah, about that really itself but it's also about the motivation and the morale and of people yeah. for the future as well right so that's one of the things i always um, i i think i'm always conflicted about as a leader i think you're always have to be conscious not of the impact of your decision on yourself but the impact of your decision on others so every time you go through change and 
degrees of change management. Um, you have to think very, very carefully about why you're doing that change and constantly, uh, you know, constantly benchmark your reasons and keep coming, revisiting your reasons and make yeah. sure it's all in, all in. Otherwise, that change management is not worth. And the third always is with people. For me, the job of a leader is not just to have the nice conversations, right? It's also to have the difficult conversations. And to be able, and the best conversations are when you can coach people into understanding that position rather than, you know, relay and inform. My style in general, I don't like to, re I can, I can say, okay, this is it right? and move on. But I always prefer coaching people to a stage where they make the decision that this isn't working out for me yeah. and something else will work out for me better. Yeah. So having those difficult conversations in a timely manner, to, but to get individuals to come to that decision may point in their own head to accept it in their own head you know it's a moment of pause and consideration deliberation in myself yeah. as a, you know, a moment of conflict also i must admit of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. you know i have to ask you this question so i'm going to ask this which is what do you see as um, differentiated in your own leadership style as a woman how do you see your own uh, leadership is differentiated as compared to perhaps and I mean, this is a woman from the woman lens. Do you see this as differentiated in any way as compared to perhaps uh, male bosses or male leaders that you may have worked under in the earlier parts of your career? There are some traits in a leader which I'm not sure they are gender. Mm. I think they're gender agnostic. Let me put it that way. Yeah. You know, I've, the ability to provide clarity, particularly when in the midst of ambiguity, right? that's one big one. Whether it's the ability to build followership for your ideas which means a, a very effective communication style uh, and a communication style that is individualized to your yeah. audience, right? So that's yeah. that's another one that leaders definitely need. Leaders who have high change agility probably are set up a little bit better for success. And then, you know, you have to have ample doses of courage as a leader because, you know, I, I heard this uh, saying a few years ago and I thought it stuck with me because I thought it was really true that a leader is recognized by the number of arrows on their back and so you know, <laughs> yeah. that I thought you have to have ample courage to be yeah. to go where nobody has gone before to have the you know to have all of the to take on the pressure of all of this ambiguity to wanting to be accountable for a set of people which is internal external everybody's looking up to you for direction and then to have all the difficult conversations and make all the difficult choices that you need to make. So if I if I look at these three, four, five things, I don't know. I mean, is there is there a difference that could a leader not have this because he's a man, or could a leader not have this because she's a woman? I'm not sure, right? I think you you need to have like these three, four things in your and of course you need hard skills with your job calls, whatever in your domain of expertise. But to the point about nuances in style, yes. Mm. Yes, definitely yes. Right? So one of the things, and I'll give you one example, but uh, yeah. my tone doesn't change too much from how I'm speaking to you. So when I'm under pressure also, it's like this. Uh, okay. When I'm having a very tough conversation also, it, it will its tonality doesn't uh, change too much. I don't, yeah. you know, you find a lot of people who if they want to make a point, and I've seen this with male managers and bosses or workers, yeah. they'll even thump the table literally, right? They thump yeah. the table literally. Um, uh, you know, their intonation and their voice will keep up, yeah. up and down. Sometimes yeah. there is repetition of the same thing over and over again, right? There is the volume, decibel volume will go higher. Uh, yeah. There's a new one. For me, it is always about, I'm sorry, but this is unacceptable. And the, I will say it yeah. once. And people who, um, People take some time. So I realized that this is something that people don't realize. The first time, you know, in my first few years as a leader, I realized that saying this, we we are used to being told. Sometimes people are, you know, if you've, if you've worked for a manager, where the style is that unless the person's voice is high volume and, you know, you're not told five times to do the same thing, you don't need yeah. to do it, right? That's yeah. That could be yeah. that could be the world you, you grew up in. And here yeah. comes in work whose voice doesn't turn octaves, you know, it stays the yeah. same, quite even toned, it's a good conversation. Yes, you know, the smiling and the, maybe a little bit of a grim face, but you know, yeah. it's not serious enough. There's, yeah. there's no need to take this seriously because we don't see the same behaviors that our previous manager was or boss was exhibiting. 
as a woman having grown up in india and today perhaps you can relate to it as well you understand i understand the disenfranchisement very well when you are a working woman you walk into some of the largest global companies in the in, in the country and uh, you will have and because you're working usually you are working with in with men you lead people just make the natural assumption that you're the junior most in the hierarchy and they start talking to the men uh, you experience inequality on a daily basis so you understand this enfranchisement perhaps better than a lot of people understand and you yeah. understand this diversity uh, question that we grapple with diversity of thought again you know gender yeah. is only the biggest manifestation of it but you understand the diversity of thought and the minority conversation in what we are not yeah. not you know demographically we are not a minority but the the representation in representation oh, yeah. conversation for minority conversation i think that i understand acutely because that is my that is my lived experience right for yeah. so do i do i have an acute understanding of disenfranchisement perhaps yes better than better than many other leaders who have walked this path before me i mean i joined cisco as a first woman in sales in india and so over the years when i talked to my male colleagues i would ask them a simple question and i would say do any of you ever watch your clock as to how you know particularly in some cities in india over others you have to be conscious about what time you land what time you get back to your hotel when you are traveling right as a as a woman so i said have you ever asked yourself that question that it's 5 o'clock now i need to leave from here so that i will be or 6 o'clock now and i need to leave from here so that i will be in my hotel by 7 or 7:30 yeah. or 8 have you ever asked yourself that question and they it would seem normal to you yeah. that they would have thought about you and yeah. uh, they said, no why would we think about it i said that's the question i asked myself even today when i land in this city right i have to plan yeah. for it according yeah. you don't have yeah. to plan for it i have to plan for yeah. it according well, i still yeah. plan for doesn't matter i've spent 25 years and i am where i am i still have to plan for it so oh, yeah. that nuance sujaya is yeah. something that i can understand and spot perhaps yeah. better than people who don't have those same lived experiences but this is perhaps a unique perspective that i bring as a woman to a leadership role on everything else as a leader it would be manifestations differently yeah. or core requirements pretty much more or less the same right and strengths will so be so well said yeah yeah but so well said and thank you for taking us through this because you've kind of brought out so many nuances and so many perspectives even as you've shared um you know the fact that the responsibility and the and the uh, behaviors or uh, the expectations remain pretty much the same notwithstanding with gender uh you're representing or you bring forth so i think with that i want to move forward to um uh, you know your own coaching uh, experiences in your early years as a professional daisy um you know are there one or two instances um, where you can recall and relate um you know coaching moment story for us um so that we can understand uh, you know what you experienced and how this has impacted you in terms of your journey um of leadership and what stays with you even today something that you learned as you were sort of growing up to be a more senior professional the the first one is from a person who was sitting in the seat that i'm sitting now but it's a story and moment that has stuck with me so till then my career in cisco you give me whatever and i will do it and i will do it well and sure. i don't ask for anything and i'm not intentional i'm not intentional yeah. about where i'm going with my career so and he said i don't get it because you know uh, you don't I, and i said what do i i thought there was something wrong with what i was saying and he said look i've now met with you for a few months and the thing i don't get is you could very easily be sitting in the seat but you don't see it for yourself you don't mm. you don't see it you don't see that you could you could be sitting in the seat and what limits you is between your ears daisy uh, and i said what does it mean he said you you need to understand your potential and live up to your potential because nobody else can live up to your potential only you can live up to your potential and so i said okay he said that means you need to know how far you can go and you you have to realize and you you have to have a recognition of realizing how far you can go and prepare yeah. for it you cannot be like unintentional and just float you do you very good at what you do but you know you can't be unintentional about your career so that was one uh, you know so i said okay uh, this and i was a bit shocked that because i had no no ambition or idea that i could 
Yeah. Ambition, yes. I always wanted to be good at what I did. I yeah. always wanted to be the best at what I did and what I did. Yeah. Right? I never had this ambition that fast forward so many years, this is potentially where I can land and build a plan back from there. So uh, I don't think I still do it, but at least I started saying, okay, if I'm sitting here, what are the next two or three things or roles that I could be doing? What's my gap? at an individual mm -hmm. level to get to that role. What are those people in those roles demonstrating very well? So that was one one point. The other point was, was about three or four years ago. And uh, this is about authenticity. And, you know, uh, because I joined, you know, my upbringing is in a largely in sales, you're in a largely uh, male dominated world. And uh, you can be uh, there are many things assigned to you. So before you walk into a role and before you walk into any role, and this is followed, and I'm sure all, a lot of women can identify with this, uh, your, the, the image of you walks in before you <laughs> into a role. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> the image of you walks in before you into a role. That's one. And two, um, you are also very, very uh, thoughtful about how the persona you have at work. And I'll be the first mm -hmm. to admit that for the yeah. first many years of my career, I had a very hard-nosed persona at work. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so to the point where we had an internal meeting a few years ago, and it was a team bonding. It was a new team that had been thrown together. And my then manager, uh, through this, you know, brought in these set of external facilities is and for all of us. And I had a wake-up moment there because we all had to, it was not about work. It wasn't about business. It was about bonding as a team. So all of us had to talk about the most important relationships in our lives and uh, the thing about me that a lot of people some people know and others broadly don't know is i have a very close what i call you could call it the sisterhood so i was talking about my family and then i talked about this this group which is as close or close to the family and one of my peers at the time who'd known me from my previous company as well he just sat forward in his seat his eyes were as big as saucers and he said daisy you have friends and I should, should have, I should have taken it as an insult, but I realized at that moment that, you know, me at work and me in my personal life, uh, how much of me I was shielding or hiding. And I, I made a decision in that, to, at the end of that two day workshop that that's it, right? What I am is, is a good, good place. And I'm, the strength of me as a leader will be best when I am at my authentic best, right? When I am myself and I can yeah. be myself. Yeah. Uh, so I made a decision, you know, not to not to show the silly, you know, I would previously not show the silly sides of myself to my teams, right? Uh, yeah. uh, most, yes, I will partake in a general conversation, but I'll never let down my guard and show the silly, yeah. silly parts of myself to anybody that mattered. Uh, yeah. And I made a decision of, saying that this is me and you know that doesn't take away from uh, from my leadership or take away from how good a leader I can be um, and for a lot of women again Jay, I think this is yeah. very I, when I tell this more publicly it's a very understandable yeah. identifiable conversation oh, yeah. I think for people in general diversity is about also about your ability to bring your true self to to the workplace you know I'm so glad you've shared this because you know, from the start of the interview, I'm thinking about which words I would use to describe you and I'm thinking authentic. So I think you've done so well with this, which is uh, to kind of really bring your real self there. And I'm so glad you're pointing out to the fact that you, your leadership is in fact that, that person who you are inside, who you're not ashamed to show up at work. Yeah. You know, the fun side, the silly side and the serious side and the excellence driven side. Um, and the side that is that means business, and I'm the side who will coach, and I'm the side that will guide. And I'm I'm just so thrilled you brought this up because you know it's kind of appears to be quintessence of who you are. So I'm really glad you raised the piece on authenticity. I'm going to move forward to I think it's the right moment to ask you about your leadership philosophy or philosophies, uh, Daisy. Which are the ones that you believe you've developed or have reflected on would be incredibly inspiring for other people to know and understand what your leadership philosophies are? I think maybe, you know, my upbringing in the tech industry, perhaps. So the first first philosophy, you have to have an innovation-centric uh, mindset, right? You have an innovation-centric mindset. And I also grew up in the sales world. So you have to have a growth 
central mindset, right? So you have to always approach every problem with, are we doing this better than what we were doing yesterday, right? And it's got nothing to do with comparing to anybody else. Uh, I once was fortunate to hear Michael Phelps live and he was asked this in our sales meeting and he was our CEO, Chuck Robbins asked him, who do you consider your greatest competitor? And he said, me. And uh, I said, yeah, you know, that 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 part is that part I identify with. So this whole innovation centric and growth centric mindset, which is about doing better today, the same thing, maybe perhaps, but doing it better today than you did yesterday or even better is to do new things right and set up for the new world. So the an innovation centric and growth centric um, leadership style, I think. The second is we all as leaders grow up and, you know, we we all start out as leaders with a focus on me. Uh, and at some point in our leadership journeys, we shift from me to we. And we realize that leadership is all about uh, is all about the service of others, right? Leadership is a is time spent in the service of others. So the third is again something which is as you grow as a leader, it becomes very important. And this is personally for me. And I very for and maybe that is why my choice of a long career at Cisco as well. And even the company I worked. I've only worked at two companies previously, Sujay. So that's a good illustration of why this is important to me. Is that everything I do has to be linked very strongly to purposeful impact and has to link back to my personal values. And you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked, started at Wipro, which always, always had uh, responsibility, uh, community responsibility as a North Star. And at Cisco, where our purpose statement is also that. And I couldn't connect what I do to creating impact not just for the business, but also for communities that we work in and we are part of. And to do it in a company where the pers my personal values and the company's values match, right? That's yeah. that's that's incredibly important. So I say for leaders, find find assignments that are not just at this, you know, obviously at the center of your intersection of your interests and passions and your capabilities, but also at the intersection of your values. Because if you can do that, right, uh, if you can be in the center of find an assignment that marries your interests and passions, your skills and capabilities, and your value system in a company whose value system matches yours, then incredible things can happen. Uh, oh, yeah. And you, you, you know, your you can live up to that full potential of yourself that you think uh, that you think you have. And the ecosystem is also set up to make you the best leader that you can become. Having yeah. purpose at the center of, I would say that's, I think after many years, we've coined a word for it. It's called purpose. Putting purpose yeah. at the heart of everything you do. Uh, that yeah. has to be, for me personally, that's a very big, I have to be able to connect back to what, why are we doing what we are doing and why am I doing what I'm doing, right? So, uh, so true, so true. It's so well said. So thank you for that. I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, Daisy. And, you know, you talk about supporting uh, the youth are empowering the youth to be able to take up careers in technology. So, um, you know, for particularly those who are uh, listening to the show and, um, you know, are people who aspire to make careers in technology or are people who are already, uh, you know, work in progress in terms of already working on careers in technology, what is your message to uh, the young people who aspire to uh, pursue careers in uh, the technologies? You know, as India, we have been maybe minus Silicon Valley. We have been uh, very. We are we are a global leader in tech skills, right? So there's no secret about that. But if we think we had it good, we have we are going to have it better, right? So there are 45 million new jobs that will get created by 2025 in the in digital skills in the digital skills in the tech space. And if you look at India, which is a country where a, very sizable population is sub 30 and still early in career and making career choices and which is also digitally more literate than the rest of the population and can has the agility to learn newer skills uh, perhaps yeah. and set up in that space even if we take 20 20 percent share of that 45 million it's eight to nine million jobs which india badly needs so i think you know as as youth as you look at your career and making a life a career for yourself also think about the competitiveness for india and what it does to india's competitiveness if all of you don't grab this opportunity with both hands now it's not going to be easy because every country in the world and the youth of every country in the world also has their eyes on the same on the same opportunity so it will mean that we will have to 
you know you have the 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 gap between our syllabus and what the real world calls for has been a perennial debate we're getting better and better at bridging it but it will mean that a student who is going to college today may not learn everything in college may also have to go off and make some sacrifices of personal time on the side and uh, you know and and get better at it even for people who are early in career and have started working it will be very important to not be satisfied that i've got a job and now my life is set and i will keep rolling along like this with this learning and unlearning and relearning that we talked about sujaya a little bit earlier it's yeah. not it's even more important to this uh, demographic and it will be very very uh, sorry if we and frankly i think india is fantastic because now the applicability of these skills for the youth who's listening in today is not just in established employers like cisco and others right if you look at what india is doing really well and you know i'm very fortunate to be uh, talking to a bunch of startups and when i look at the startup founders of today they are coming straight from college to with some brilliant ideas and setting up uh, and um, you know with some great skills and so you have a pathway to prosperity to economic prosperity and to create differentiation for india not just in the organized uh, companies but also take a great idea out on your own and the ecosystem today is not like it was even 5 years ago right whether it's the government whether it's ecosystems like tech companies like ours whether it's finance you know venture capitalism and financing partners everybody is the ecosystem is set up to and allow you to succeed if you are starting in a in the tech space uh, in india on your own the the environment in india is so much uh, conducive to you starting and opening your own business in the country as well so entrepreneur you can go down you can have all the tech skills and you can choose not to work for a big brand but to become the next big brand out of india and i think the cnn article which just came out a couple of days ago talks about the next trillion dollar industry from india which is the saas companies which are coming out of india and so many of them are young young founders all below the age of 30 right so uh, very very exciting times ahead the past is no indicator of the future in terms of our opportunity in terms of tech skills so it's ours to grab and um, it's not just about getting a job anymore it's about yes getting a job being very successful individually but also continuing to keep india's flag flying high uh, in this new arena of we must be the digital skills nation for the world yeah yeah absolutely lovely so um i think with that we come to an end of this very brilliant conversation i must say um you know i have to thank you for your authenticity thank you for your candor uh thank you for the details and the nuances you invested in in terms of the way in which you articulated your responses so thank you so much daisy chitila pali for being able to join us today in this conversation on in the lead i'm hoping we have an opportunity to be able to connect and speak again but for today thank you and um, for the audience do remember to like share and subscribe if you did like this episode of in the lead and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you get notifications for future episodes for now we want to be able to say thank you and goodbye to daisy chitilapalli thank you ever so much daisy thank you sujaya wonderful being here thank you again for having me thank you thank you